your new slumbering burrows who are having a good time on the radio. Today is Best Behavior Day because runners from everywhere all over the world are going to be patting down your streets. It's New York City Marathon Day. And for all you marathoners, time to get up and stretch those legs. It's going to be a long day. Well, good morning. I'm Jim McKay. You know, it's an audacious idea, really, running a full marathon of 26 miles, 385 yards through the weary streets of New York City. It was started by a slight bearded transplanted Transylvanian named Fred Lebo. His idea was to run four times around Central Park, and that's the way the marathon began. But a few years later, the audacious idea was broached to run through all five boroughs. Oh, well, they must have seen it coming. Heavens open and it rained. It was moved to the course which covers all five boroughs in 1976. Down through Brooklyn, over into Queens, they'll hit Manhattan, they'll hit Bronx, every borough of New York City. We walked along the avenue. His hands were stronger than. How did Fred Lebo go from the Romanian-born businessman to director of an event that on one day in November pulls together our entire city, every state in the Union, and thousands around the world? has the largest marathon in the United States. It is the largest spectator sporting event, over 500 and the largest field of international runners. There will be more than 80 countries. And the greatest number of volunteers anywhere ever for this big marathon. Like two million spectators lining the streets. It's the most famous marathon in the world. And this site needs no words. In those days, runners were dedicated to the sport. There were many more people running faster than slower. We were all kind of hardcore. And it wasn't a big social world of running. It was a small social world of running. And we weren't involved with a popular sport. We were like the offbeat people. The road running, uh, it was uh, people were thought of as freaks. Uh, our uniforms were probably underwear almost. I mean, at least the top was, you know, and somebody had a white short. It really did look like we were all running around in our underwear. I can remember in the winter, somebody at the halfway mark giving out brandy. That was running back in 1969. We started up and started to form a road runners club, uh, set up a, a racing program, included a four miler, a marathon it was in the Bronx. It's called a cherry tree marathon. Doing things out of apartment houses and our, our rooms and our, out of bars. We, we started off really up at the Yankee Stadium. McCombs Dam Park, well, that was the meeting place which is right across the street from Yankee Stadium, in the men's locker room. So there wasn't any room for, for women running. We were a very insular group of people up there. And of course, if you were from the Bronx or around the Bronx and you, you're McCombs Dam, you thought you knew everything. And then a kind of a, a, an idiosyncratic fellow came on the scene who had a little sports car. I remember a little kind of an orange kind of little sports car. He wore a little hat. Uh, with a beard, Fred Lebeau. He was 
was originally a, a ripoff artist in the garment industry. He would go to these expensive uh, fashion shows and see the most expensive garments, and he was an expert at how do you make these garments really cheap for everybody. And he would rip off the, the design and fuel companies with opportunity. It was very, uh, you know, in certain ways, sophisticated, more, more, than, more than we were. And he was involved in, in uh, downtown Manhattan, you know, downtown. That was the world he seemed to come from. And it gave you two reactions. One, you know, this was, you know, like super slick. And on the other side, suspicion, you know. <laughs> but this, this is not the all running. He would invite us to openings down there. I think, I don't know if it was to impress us. I, I never really got the whole thing, but, and we'd have to wear a black tie and we would show up and there were, the women that were all these uh, models and stuff, and it was, and they were all tugging at his shoulders and I don't know if he had this thing set up or what, but he, he looked like this was a whole brave new world we had never seen before, you know. He had an elan and a savoir-faire, and he was had that European kind of quality of, of kindness and attractiveness that, that you know, a lot of men, American men didn't have in those days. He was sort of a weird guy. He'd come in his uh, suit and his uh, long black leather coat. And a uh, very entertaining individual would certainly take people out. He took us to all his fancy places, which we said, yeah, they're, they're vacuous and empty. Why do you want to go to this, these things for? You know, you have more fun with us, you know? There was still this sense, I have to have a purpose in life. And he wasn't getting the, getting the purpose in, in the garment industry where he worked. The love affair with New York, how did that begin? Well, it actually began when I discovered Central Park. It was in 1969. Came to the reservoir one Sunday, and I did one lap, 1.58 miles in 18 minutes, which was very slow. Fred ran like a duck, except he was slower than a duck. I mean, he was slow. Not many people ran that weren't good, run really good runners. So um, it really was a pretty unique situation. He'd run races and finish way, way, way back, because not many people would risk their ego doing that. Fred went out and ran every day. If it was the end of a long day for Fred, didn't have any wife, kids, out the door he went. I found running like an oasis in my life. I just put my running shoes on and shorts and short, I'm off running Central Park. And then in 1970, we began to uh, lose our ability to function in the Bronx. The traffic had increased, and there were kids uh, throwing rocks. <laughs> Fred began to tell people, look, you, you got to, let's take it out of the Bronx. Let's get it, you know, in the big time here. My God, that was heresy, you know, Manhattan. At the time, there were maybe half a dozen runners on the reservoir. Nobody talked about running. And I said, it's closed for traffic on weekends. Why don't we put a marathon in Central Park? Central Park wasn't built for running. It was built for horses and carriages to drive around. The idea of people running around the park in what appears to be their underwear or less would have been impossible. People didn't go out of their houses looking like that. Up and down the hills and who's gonna watch what and who knows, who can count the laps? You'll never, there'll be mistakes, everything will be screwed up. And everybody thought he was, oh, who's this interloper? You know, he's, uh, he, he, where does he get all these ideas? And that was how he operated, disturbing what we all believed was the norm. You're doing something for so many years and and you're doing it your way, and you're doing it this way, and all of a sudden this guy is telling you, uh, 
we should be doing it a different way, or we should want to promote the sport more. Fred loved that. He wanted to attract the world. Uh, but I think most of the older running community didn't need that. He could see things a lot of us couldn't see. And, uh, and he didn't really care who he annoyed. He wanted to take the running scene public. He talked them all into it in 1970, the uh, first New York City Marathon in Central Park. The total cost was less than $1,000. I paid for myself. I bought 15 cheap watches, a very gaudy trophy. I didn't know what to do or how to put a marathon on. <laughs> Judges, referees, runners, hold it till you hear the gun. Get ready. Central Park is a very tough place to run a marathon. It's uh, up and down. I don't think there's one patch of 15 yards that's level down there. There were baby carriages that you were going around, the people. Very few of us were watching, I would say. <laughs> You know, there were less people watching the race than were in the race, and in the race there weren't a lot of people. I mean, we showed up in Central Park, and I don't remember whether it was a dollar or 50 cents to enter. I was entered in the race. Lucky day for me. After I got my prize and my trophy, uh, he actually said, could I have it back because I don't have enough for somebody else. It was really just another race. It happened to be in Central Park, but it was just another marathon. But Fred kept calling me and asking me to tell the press that I was going to try to break three hours. And I was not ready to break three hours. So I didn't know how to handle the stress. And so I ran about 15 miles, and then I decided, you know, I was tired, and, and it might be better for me to quit. And of course, you know, <laughs> it lives in history, the first New York City Marathon, no women finishes. No spectators, no press, um, no crowds. No water. They were basically talking to themselves. It had no uh, cachet. It didn't really reach out. I think it bothered Fred a little bit that he felt um, somewhat ignored, uh, somewhat uh, looked upon as, who is this guy? He sort of worked his way through it. It was more a question of trying to find his identity and being able to take what he knew and expand on it. Once I discovered running, I spent less and less time in the garment industry. Fred sort of started to coordinate things and started to use his apartment as the official Roadrunners Club office. Our apartment was a sixth floor walk-up, so when we had people come by to pick up something, we had a basket we let down on the wind outside the window. Or if someone had something for us, they would put it in the basket, we'd pull the basket up. When Fred was doling out safety pins and putting a little of his own money into the race, he was planning the next year maybe we can have 300 people. And wouldn't that be something pretty incredible? And maybe I can get someone even to pay for the numbers, you know, put their name on it. Johnson's Wax called Fred Lee Bow and said, we want to do a women's only marathon. We'll name it after this product that we're trying to launch, which is Crazy Legs, which was a women's shaving cream. It was edge, in fact, turned pink. Fred said, gosh, you know, thinking really fast, he could only get six or seven or eight women together to run a marathon. It wasn't going to be a very successful promotion. Why don't we do, like, one loop of Central Park, a short race, you know, six miles, and we will call it a mini marathon because the mini skirt was in fashion at the time. And of course, Fred was still in the garment business and he was out there hawking mini skirts. So he said, mini marathon, that has a real cachet for women. And Fred felt that they needed to get publicity for it. So they went to the Playboy Club and convinced some Playboy bunnies to be our promoters and run in the race. And that certainly brought out the press. Oh. <laughs> Nina and I had to do these photo ops of the bunnies, and we weren't exactly thrilled about it, but that was 
That was Fred. He wanted the race to be successful for women, and if it took bunnies to help, it was going to do that. What do you think of this crazy legs thing here? Oh, I think it's fantastic because this is a real breakthrough for women. This is the first um, exclusive long distance race for women. Oh, this is the first marathon of its kind, the first road runners race in the country, I believe, for girls. And it's a six mile course, and I'm sure there'll be all levels of com competitors. Some will rest on the way, some will go all the way, I'm sure. What are women doing going out and competing in, in physical activity? when they should be home having children, raising their children, making their dinners for their family. Well, you have three children. When do you find time to run? <laughs> well, they play. I've, I run while they play. And if I want to go for a long run, uh, you know, 15 or 20 miles, I'll, I'll get a babysitter. Just like somebody, some other women will go to the beauty parlor or play bridge or go bowling. I, I go running. You are looking forward to it? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I mean, we, you can see us smiling and, and laughing at the start and everything, but once that gun went off, it was a very competitive race. And um, it was a fantastic success. My daughter ran. She was, what, nine years old or something? She ran, yeah. He used women to promote his event, but it helped us tremendously in getting exposure we needed for our cause. One hundred and fifty-seven women. It's been the largest, longest road on the event in the entire world. We have people, I won't mention their names, who had big conchos in the USA track and field who said women shouldn't run over a mile. And, uh, and what Fred did is he brought a whole new dimension to the, to the uh, sport uh, because before him, and the reason why there were such small numbers uh, running uh, to some extent was that uh, everyone was not encouraged. We all worked together. We were passionate to make this work. We knew the rest of the world thought we were nutty, uh, but we didn't think we were nutty. And we worked together. It was then the New York Roadrunners Club. It was very much a club. Fred was there every day. He quit his job, and, and he was there getting the day-to-day -day things going, thinking up ideas, He's making people enthusiastic to make it work. I had come to Manhattan from a little town in Oregon, and all I had to bring me there was my running. And I was running in Central Park, and a guy was standing at 90th and 5th and he was asking for volunteers to come and stuff envelopes. And I began by volunteering to stuff envelopes for hours and hours. And as Fred was an expert at doing, found a little social network, you know, for a free piece of pizza, you could sit there all afternoon and he got people to do his work. So he hired me and lo and behold, for the next 20 years, um, I was attached to him as co-worker and he is my mentor. Everything that he had made, every dime he had made in the garment industry went into Roadrunners. And for years, he paid people salaries with that money. He virtually walked around penniless all the time. He would go in, stop in a restaurant, have dinner, and then not be able to pay the people. And the next day, they'd be calling Roadrunners and saying, well, you know, Fred owes us $12. That was the norm. That happened everywhere. It was simple. It was a simple existence. And there would be certainly a lot of people who would mother him. People would bring lunch to him. He was the kind of person that you wanted to take care of, and everybody wanted to do that. So everybody pitched in. We were very family oriented. We used to wait till his sister brought him food. She was like his surrogate mother, and we would all wait like vultures. And when she left, he would give us, you know, all this wonderful food she brought. So uh, he always took care of us. I'm going to make for you Fred's favorite, favorite food. He loved latkes. Whenever he came, it was Hanukkah. He liked latkes any day. So whenever I went to his house, I made latkes. I'm going to make you so you can taste it. 
it smells delicious and um, here it is oh it's hot we were seven children I was the fifth and then uh, wait a minute no I was this yeah there was Moishi Simcha Shloimi Esti and me Fred and Sarah Fred's father was a real dreamer. I don't want to say he had his head in the clouds, but that's, for the most part, that's, that's the way everyone described him. He was very beloved by people, like socially. He had a newsstand, and uh, people would just come by, sometimes to buy, sometimes just to talk. My grandmother was the one who kind of had the, the, the fire, and she would get things done. It was a very happy house. And then there's a war, the things change, it was never the same. We had fears, you know, what's going to happen. And then the communists started taking over and we started thinking, oh, we gotta leave. So my mother and father said, all right, you go first and then we'll follow you. And that's when they, the family had to split and, and Fred went with Mike. He left, uh, he was, I think he was 14. That's what I think. And I must have been eight, eight years old. And um, he left early in the morning and I was asleep, so nobody woke me up. There was a transport going from, uh, from Romania to Israel via Holland. Czechoslovakia, they said, you know, I think you ought to stay here in Czechoslovakia because we don't know how the border is going to be further on in Germany and Holland and so forth. Now, we were alone in Weyton Fan for 13 years. I used to cajole him, talk to him, and he didn't like it, you know. But uh, I felt I'm the older brother, and sometimes he would say, I know, I, I, I can take care of myself, I can take care of myself, you don't have to tell me, you know? First letter we received when we were in Czechoslovakia from our parents, I started reading it. I had tears in my eyes. I didn't want Fred to know. So I gave him the letter, I said, Fred, you read it. <laughs> First time away from home. When I was a kid, all I wanted to survive. You know, we were hiding from the Nazis, then hiding from the Soviets, and finally going out into the world and, and seek a better life. My parents came to uh, Brooklyn, so he moved to Brooklyn. Then I met him when he was already 32. Fred's uh, memories of, uh, from him between 14 and 32, I have no memory because I didn't see him. We were uh, separated. We call him Fischl, when he came home, we call him Fischl. My kids called him Uncle Fischl. We knew that uh, they call him Fred and that he changed to Le Ball, a very French, or Le Ball. My mother wrote to me, I feel like he's a stranger.
everything, everything could be solved if you would only run. Everything. Everything was running. That was his life, you know, his religion. When I came in to visit him, if it was time for him to run, whether it was, I was there only for 30 seconds, sorry, got to go. The New York City Marathon race in Central Park was in trouble, course-wise. The four-plus lap route was not uh, suitable for the number of participants because officials couldn't uh, keep up with the count of the runners. So the course, in that sense, was obsolete. Here we were in Central Park where bicycles would cut across us and people would push their baby carriages in front of us and people would have their frisbee game going on. And it was so annoying and very dispiriting. George Pitts came around and he said, Fred, why don't you have a marathon in the five boroughs? Now I qualified for Boston in 75, huge crowds, and I said, why can't we have one here? Boston was the great dream race for all of us because it ran through the streets and the public knew the race um, and were educated about the race and grew up on the race and cheered everybody knowledgeably. Uh, George Spitz had the idea of this race to celebrate the bicentennial and he and Fred got together. It was expected this would be a race one time just for that celebration. The five-hour thing was, 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 was not new, okay? But the, 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 the ability to do it was new. There's no such thing as original music, <laughs> you know? And the, the idea would have come around regardless of me, but it could never have come into existence without Fred LeBeau. And even I was like, well, do they want us? <laughs> do they want us to do that? Will that really be helpful to the runners? Will it be safe? Uh, people thought this was madness. Go through all five boroughs and across the Farzano Bridge, no less. I mean, it was, there was, oh, this can't be done. And it took a lot of politicking and, you know, Percy Sutton and all the people that uh, really got behind this thing. The idea was, when we sat at that table, was to draw the route. We were gonna start it across the bridge in Staten Island. We'll come across here, we're going to Brooklyn, and then we'll go from there to Queens. And then we want the Bronx, we want to be sure we get it into the Bronx. Gary Murky, who won the first New York City Marathon in Central Park, came to me in the park I got a hold of my, my lapel and said, Fred, you're making a disastrous decision. How could you run a marathon, women and men, through the terrible neighborhoods of, of Bedford, Stuyvesant, and Harlem? How could you do that? I pretended I wasn't concerned. I was nervous. I was very nervous. One of the, the ways that Fred sold the concept of the Fibro Marathon to the city was that the city needs something positive. You went through some of the worst economy that you know the city ever had. The city was ready to go bankrupt. We're facing up to the financial crisis confronting this city and state. We need your help. I know you're going to give it. One week ago, New York City tottered on the brink of financial default, which was deferred only at the 11th hour. And when New York City now asks the rest of the country to guarantee its bills, it can be no surprise that many other Americans ask why. Financial crisis and the escalating crime in the uh, city of New York, the uh, statement, the Bronx is burning, because there was a lot of arson. Of course, people 
around the world to see New York as a center of crime and a place to be avoided. There were always attempts to disprove the fact that you could do this on any different level. You're going into the Bronx? What does that mean? How safe is that going to be? So there was a lot of skepticism. There were running jokes of running for your life instead of running for your life. A period of time when New York City needed something, he was the person that was needed. And here's the pool and the rocket ship. He enjoyed taking on challenges that no one else would, could imagine could be possible. His um, identity, his uniqueness in this world was that he confused people. It was all about mirrors and shells and moving things around and hiding things. And he did that to create the first marathon, the first five borough marathon, because he knew that we needed people to believe in us. And we didn't have anything to believe in yet, except for his vision of how great it was going to be. So he assured everybody that the numbers were there for everyone, and even made up numbers. And he assured the runners that we had plenty of support, plenty of sponsors. We didn't have it. Uh, the Roadrunners and Fred were broke. They didn't have a penny. Fred was out there beating the bushes looking for money to support the marathon. And the Garmin Center, I guess, produces a different type of salesperson. So he, he was rough and tumble sales. The people at the bank, the senior officers of the bank, when they met him, and they all fell in love with him. They bought into it very well. I mean, you know, $5,000 is a lot of money to sponsor in those days, especially sponsor something that no one really knew what it was all about. I mean, this was a time when no one used the word event marketing. Sponsorship was very, very new, very green. He had in his mind always the vision of how he wanted events run, and he was so headstrong, he had no intimidation. He assured the press that we had plenty of runners. We didn't know how many runners we had at that point. I won the Boston Marathon in 1975, set the American record. In 76, I made the Olympic team along with Frank Shorter. Frank ran superbly in the Olympic Games. I ran really poorly. Fred LeBoque, he invited us both to the first five borough New York City Marathon. I had something to prove because I had run so, I failed, you know, in the Olympic Games. So I say, yeah, we, we want to do it. I was coming in sort of to support running in New York and to meet this crazy guy who thought he could run through all five boroughs of the city, because I wanted to see if it could happen. What better thing than to have those two Americans at the first five borough race, just having come off the 1976 Olympics. And it was one of those things where all came together. It was the right time. There was the window. And it created a huge, huge media and, um, and a great following and gave a local little race that was in Central Park. Suddenly it was not only in the streets of New York, but it had the best runners in the world here. He assured the sponsors that the press was there eager and the crowds were all going to be there. Going in the marathon, he was so nervous about it. He was up, I don't think, I think he went three nights in a row he didn't sleep. And uh, I saw him maybe two nights before the first five row marathon. And he said, Bob, I don't think I'm going to make it. If I don't make it, you're in charge. And I said, no, <laughs> no way I'm in charge of the marathon. You're nuts. Then a bunch of kids come and says, you guys run into my turf. No permission to do that. The police are okay that you don't believe in police. But I gave him t-shirts and jackets and caps for the group to become marshals on the course. <laughs> Never came around again. Getting the, the, the police and other people within the boroughs to embrace it. He was very good at going out and, and com creating a kind of communal exercise that kept people involved as if it was part of their race. And what it was is that everybody believed him. So they all showed up and we had the numbers. <laughs> and that was genius. And so it began. The year was 1976.
marathon morning, he was running around with a bullhorn, yelling at people, screaming at people, do this, do that. It was like you would need a checklist of 100 things to check. His checklist was in his head. And if he walked by and saw something that wasn't right, he would go crazy. My brother drove me out to the Barrasano Bridge, parked his car on the bridge, and we lined up for the race. And that's, you know, it was that simple. It was a beautiful day the first year, and it was so exciting, you know, running over the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. We thought the race was huge. There were 2,000 marathoners that first year. It started through the acidic areas of Brooklyn, and I was looking at all the young kids and everyone standing out there looking, and I realized these people are witnessing something they've never seen before. Of course, we wanted it in all five boroughs, so there was just that little dip into the Bronx. And it was literally around a telephone pole. I don't know of any marathons, small or large, in the history of the sport that people ran upstairs. And all I could think of was when I went up it was, Frank Shorter went up those stairs too? <laughs> he had ever run a marathon uh, or any significant distance before. And there were people out there cheering their lungs out. Running over that bridge and everything was exciting as hell. Queensboro Bridge, you're coming to Manhattan and boom, excitement, the energy of that. no barriers and the people just all around and the banner was maybe 20 feet wide but you literally finished and sat down on the benches at the finish line and waited for your friends to finish we knew we had a successful event we didn't know how successful it's going to be we couldn't anticipate my wildest dream that this was going to happen. Twenty-six miles, three hundred eighty-five yards. No one was mugged. No one was hit by a taxi. For the city of New York and Bill Rogers, the marathon was a resounding success. Dick Shap, NBC News, in Central Park.
It absolutely coincided with the rebirth of the city. Don't forget that no matter where that race ran, and not every neighborhood it runs through was pristine. That neighborhood was groomed and beautified before that race, and when, those, when that happened and those people came through and it brought the people out in the neighborhood, that created not just a celebration of the running event, a celebration of each and every neighborhood, of all the population, of the city. I think it's really a great idea. It's good publicity for New York City, which has such a, <laughs> well, <laughs> a sort of reputation. People were cheering instead of booing. People were hugging instead of punching. Five ball race actually put running right on everybody's doorstep. What we could see in the demand and the excitement of people for the next year's race. Runners like doubled and, and it kept going exponentially. And then we knew we had something. From 14 countries they came, 5,000 marathoners. More than 20 of them Olympics veterans. Charging across the Verrazano Narrows Bridge to begin the long distance run, stretching more than 26 miles. 279 of the competitors women, three times as many women as last year, running in the biggest marathon ever, two-thirds more people than the Boston Marathon last spring. Oh, Bill Rogers, Bill Rogers, he again proved he's the best marathoner in America, perhaps the best marathoner in the world. <laughs> so now as those who finish further back in the field come in to get their blankets, two things seem clearly established. Number one, Bill Rogers is a stat... <clears throat> rats. The marathon... Uh, in the in those days did have what I call star power. It was my Olympics in a way. It was great fun. It was a great kickoff and started a string of um, chances, opportunities. They so went. And now as the runners who finished further back come in to get their wraps, two things seem clear. First, Bill Rogers is further established as the U.S. long-distance marathon runner. And secondly, this New York sporting event seems clearly established as a major international sporting competition. Bill Stewart, ABC News, New York. Going up First Avenue, when Fred noticed people on the balconies of the apartments cheering, I remember he said, I think we've made it. I said, why? He said, look at the people. The sport is growing and growing and growing. I call it kind of a perfect storm of these different things happening at once to create this explosion. Fitness was coming into vogue. Uh, treadmills were just coming onto the scene. Then gradually, middle class white kids from the 60s who had spent all their time in the sexual revolution and, 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 and all sorts of drugs and so all sorts of time getting older and worrying about old age and dying. <laughs> they needed another drug. There has been an astonishing growth in the popularity of long distance running, especially in this city. I found it the easiest city to work with. I've heard people from other cities calling me up, how did you get New York to do all this? We can't get them to close one block. And you've got them to close bridges and roadways and over 300 intersections, it's amazing. London Marathon came out of New York. You know, the whole modern, urban, big city marathons around the world. Moscow Marathon started up, Beijing. New York City Marathon really was the race that gave it a push for the road running boom to go global. And you found time to run in what, 11 marathons this year? Uh, 12. No, 11 different countries. 11 different countries, 12 marathons. Did you miss the fact that you don't get to run in your marathon? I do, but I've compensated for it. Uh, I always make sure I run a marathon about a few weeks or a month before. And the boom continues to snowball, fueled by reports that running strengthens the heart, that runners have better sex lives, that social contacts are improved at weekend races. You know, the park became the best singles bar in New York, and all you had to do was show up in the evening and, you know, say to a guy or a girl, gee, where'd you get those shoes? And bang, you had a relationship. And, uh, and Fred was into that better than most. I mean, he had more girlfriends than anyone I knew. 
you'd, you'd go to a party and everybody would talk about their running. Yeah. <laughs> it was really boring. But uh, you know, that was the thing back then. So for every year, we'd have more and more and more people wanting to come out and be in these races. A few seconds after midnight, over 3,000 people crowd the New York City main post office. Their objective? An early postmark to improve their chances of being accepted to run the New York City Marathon. The world-class runners are automatically admitted to this race. Correct. But thousands of other amateur runners from all over the world want to get in as well. How do they get in? Try to cajole us, uh, sometimes threaten us, and sometimes even bribe us. And uh, well, it's expected when you have over 20,000 people rejected. They train very hard all year round. And finally, when they're ready for it, then we just say, I'm sorry, but we're overbooked. It gives people from all over the world a chance to see the city in ways that they never expected to. That's right. Well, I've seen you run in Central Park. Yeah, I know. Uh, Don't uh, start talking about getting me into the marathon. No, your wife finished the marathon. Uh, my wife didn't. I didn't. I okay. know. You went to America. You know all the sore points, don't you, Fred? <laughs> 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 we'll be back right after this word. <laughs> he was sort of a Pied Piper, someone who was beginning to start this so-called revolution. One had seven heart attacks and a coronary bypass. Right. right. We have a woman who's 80 years old. Right. And there are many. There are 16,000 stories. I'm just surprised when I read that um, there are 34 million Americans who run or jog. I wonder where the rest of the 60 million are that should be running, or at least race walking. I sure hope you like our new uh, award ceremony program. It surprised me. Um, but I'm certainly delighted to be part of this organization after what I see here tonight. Um, but and I think Fred felt of takes, sorts that he was a missionary, convert people to the marathon, expand the Road Runners Club, them, make it a place that not only was wrapped up in the New York Marathon, but wrapped up in a whole program by 78, Fred and the Roadrunners were organizing a race every week. Fred, could you tell me a little bit about this race? Well, it's our uh, annual bagel run. We're going to have bagels, cream cheese, and lox. Bagels, bagels! Themed races. The innovative things, the Halloween run. We used to have an event called the Baked Apple Run. Fifth Avenue Mile. All the other races he had going backwards, forwards, up the Empire State Building. Across town today, the press agents were out in force at the Empire State Building, staging a publicity stunt so silly that we decided to cover it. Fred comes along with this idea that we can run up the Empire State Building, and I don't know where he got the idea. Corporate challenge was another one. Not content to sit and knit. The international breakfast run. The idea of bringing together all the international runners, have them meet at the UN. You know, like a New Year's Eve run, um, at, at the stroke of midnight on New Year's Eve. There was always something exciting. There was always something dramatic. Fireworks and champagne at the water stations. You take the idea of a 
pasta before running a race, and it's a really simple idea. It's just about nutrition, but who else but Fred could have made this gigantic pasta party? He had crazy ideas. Some were great. Like, uh, some were terrible, but we did them anyway. In the 11th New York City Marathon, there are over 16,000 entries. They come from 50 states and 43 countries, and many of them use the world's largest urinal. We also have the first time uh, T-shirt trading going on, and it's very popular. Runners love to trade T-shirts. We'll make sure it's going to be clean shirts. Huh? What can we be giving the runner? You know, manufacturers Hanover, we would give the shirts. He would have Perrier creating running shorts. He would get John Hancock or someone to sponsor the crazy little running hats. Transit workers have gone on strike in and around New York City. Fred, right away, let's promote running. Let's, let's make a t-shirt. Uh, run to work. He was the first one who went in the evening to his sneakers, and sneakers became so popular. I think it was him, I don't know, I credited him. He had these visions. I mean, when he said he was going to buy the brownstone, people said that's the craziest thing. Imagine when you think about it. And Fred was able to put together a team of, of co-signers, and that allowed us to buy the building. And here was a, a running club with a real Hassle. identity and, and offices, and it was professional. This is the way it should be. People really think he developed road running, and while he did that and created an environment for world-class athletes, what was most important was that he knew how to create a spectacle. Uh, two, side three, interview with Fred Lebeau. What drives Fred Lebeau? Uh, goals. Achievements. Uh, success in events. New events. Creating events. I get bored by sameness. He was always looking for something new. He was always in motion. That was Fred. It always had to be better. The 1978 New York City Marathon was uh, my first road race ever. When we called the New York Roadrunners Club and asked if I could run the marathon, uh, it was his secretary who picked up the phone and she didn't know who I was. She kind of said, no, oh, I don't think so. When Fred came into the office, he saw my name and uh, he was asking his secretary, you know, Greta Weitz, uh, what is her name doing here? She's a world-class uh, track runner, so let's invite her. That decision really changed my life. My longest run before coming to New York was 11 or 12 miles. I entered the race very late. Nobody knew who I was. My starting number was 1173, and I can still hear the voice of the commentator, like, who is 1173? She's going to win the race, setting a new world record, cross the finish line, happy that I, you know, I'm done. I see him, and I said, never, ever again. Greta Weitz of Norway, world record holder and two-time defending champion. Greta Weitz, who won for the fourth time. Sixth time. Seven victories for Greta Weitz. A New Yorker from Norway. Victory number eight. 
Catherine Switzer, who once won this race herself. And I'm sure that all eyes on the women's side, Catherine, focus on Greta Weitz. That's for sure, Jim. If the New York City Marathon has a single real legend, it has to be Greta Weitz. So for the ninth time, Greta Weitz is the woman of the day at the New York City Marathon. That's nine out of 11 attempts. A tremendous mark. No one's ever done that before. There's Fred Lebo, the president. I spent a lot of time in New York, and every time I was here, I went by the New York Roadrunners Club, and you know, I talked to Fred, and uh, we invited Fred to come to visit me in Oslo. So in the 80s, you know, Fred, he was no longer, for me, a race organizer. He was a friend. Greta, who he plucks out of European track runners and ends up making her worthy of a New York Times editorial an Olympic medal, a world championship, and a whole new career. And the two of them created a, an extremely famous partnership. They both became very famous together. Fred loved, as it went on, he loved the celebrity. He loved being who he was and uh, played it that way. Okay, well, well uh, Fred, there's another thing that's unique about the corporate. <laughs> He would dress only in his uh, runner's outfits. I would set up meetings with mayors and others for him, and he'd show up with the cap and, the, and a running jacket and all sneakers. And when I first saw it, I said, whoa, you know, I'd always wear a shirt and a tie and jacket. It's fine, you come in costume. I come in things dressed as a tree, because I was the parks commissioner. What I was looking for was given there is a New York Marathon, who are the people that run in it and who run it? And here was this character, this charismatic, loquacious, manipulative fellow that talked a lot of sense, made sense to me. I mean, I certainly liked the way he talked about his race and the people that ran in it. He was so enthusiastic. He always had an angle. I mean, he knew your mind. He could read what you were interested in, what might interest you, just a master salesman. The characters, the dynamic people, we like to hear their story. I'm so glad, trouble on as always, no I don't. Fred always said that he needed to be famous for the organization to be famous. And, and so he was very willing to be important. And you are the president of the New York Roadrunners Club and director of the New York City Marathon. really one of these like rock stars he was personality that women were very attracted to and it, it always seemed like their names ended with with e uh, Susie Becky Bonnie but we called them Fifi's Debbie Doty we, they, and so we said we had his Fifi file of a, and once I came upstairs and one of them had braces and I went in his room and I said Fred this is it I draw the line We were traveling <laughs> to Amsterdam. So we were sitting in the lounge at JFK, and I was asking Fred something. And he said to me, when we go to the gate, you walk ahead of me. And I said, why? He said, well, I don't want people to think that we're together. And I said, why not? You could do worse than me, Fred. And he said, well, you're too old for me, Ann. And I was, I'm about 20 years younger than Fred. I said, excuse me? He said, well, you, you just are. I said, oh, all right. <laughs> and that was Fred's relationship with women. You get bored with women easily? That's, yeah, that, that's my main problem. What bores you with them? Once I have achieved 
anything alive, I'm not satisfied with it. I love the chase, uh, chase the success of the New York Marathon or chase other women. And once I've achieved that, I find it no longer attracts me. You are not married at 50, you've never been married. Right. Uh, you once were seeing a girl for a long time and then it broke up. I set myself a goal of running two and a half thousand miles for the year. At that time I was leaving this girl, she wanted to get married, or at least have a child, and to make some commitment. I kept stalling, stalling, stalling. The day before New Year's, I came home, I realized that I was 19 miles short. She was just about getting ready to put on her evening gown. For New Year's Eve party? New Year's Eve, it was a black tie party, and I told her, listen, we'll be a little bit late, because I had to go out and do a run. Uh, I ran, I think, three loops plus to make sure I didn't shorten it. And I came back to the apartment, it was almost 10 o'clock, and I got up to the fifth floor. There's my bag with a note on it outside the door, uh, saying, uh, as I promised, goodbye. One of the reasons he never married and never had children was in those years when he was so young. I think he was 14 when he left his parents. And I think that he needed to be nurtured a lot longer than he was. Fred did never talked a lot about his childhood or his time before he came to, to the United States. Uh, um, he, once in a while, he would tell some stories. We, uh, because it was painful, so we didn't talk about it. Because I didn't ask him, because I didn't probe, I don't know how much he would have given on it and, and, and how, how he, you know, was holding it inside of himself or perhaps that he just simply lived in the moment. We don't have any particular design or plan. I'll make a brief statement, and we'll both answer questions together. What do you make your statement? Give us a lead. I beg your pardon, sir. What does sheet the marathon mean? Who's asking the question? This gentleman? The story in the Times this morning indicates that an eyewitness saw her take a subway to the finish line in New York City. If everyone says I didn't cross the finish line, OK. Mr. LeBeau, though, in, in, makes a plan to send uh, everyone this little certificate which is an official certificate of everyone who has finished the New York City Marathon. I believe this woman is a imposter. I am not a marathon runner per se. I haven't been running for 15 years. The fact that I ran a course of 26 miles to myself, um, coming across the finish line with a time of two hours and 31 minutes, I think is remarkable for me. Um, and Fred looks at her, not sweaty at all, overweight, and say, you didn't run this race. She says, yes, she did. Last night, we checked the videotapes of our finish line, and we have conclusive evidence that she did not cross the finish line. Can a person's number be obstructed? Not in the tapes I saw. No numbers were obstructed. Do you see every number? None. Every number. Every number. Somebody saw Rosie, got on a train with her, went to the station. I was never on a subway on that day of the race. We maintained this trust that Runners were there to see what they could accomplish. And we just had this sense of trust that you wanted to run your race to see what you could do. We didn't think about people trying to cheat. Fred wanted to see justice done. And he was furious about anybody who came in and kind of made a mockery further of this thing, which was threatening to bring a scandal onto running. And then when people started making fun of the fact that Rosie had pulled this off. Example, a runner going to the New York City Marathon wearing a Rosie Ruiz Track Club t-shirt, which had a picture of a subway token as its symbol. I'm Johnny Carson, the Rosie Ruiz of comedy. <laughs> no, what I mean by that, I'm, what I mean by that, I'm around at the finish, but nobody can prove I did any jokes in between. <laughs>
Kind of a weird case, wasn't it? Nobody seems to know what's going on back there. It was all things that he was now reacting to rather than orchestrating and initiating. I mean, putting that out there was a way of just slapping at Fred's soul. It was getting inside, it was gnawing, it was saying, you missed it, guy. How could you, how could you blow this? He was totally incensed. The marathon was like a holy grail. And, you know, it upset him greatly. And so anybody who made fun of it, he was just on their case like a madman. It was naive of us to think that nobody would cheat. We couldn't believe anybody would do it. Because why? You're only cheating yourself. But now, suddenly, running had become famous, big. Um, it gave people recognition. And now we were going to have to grow up alongside of that. Fred realized that as the sport was changing, things were happening that sometimes you can control so much and then there's a moment where your, your good fellowship is, is, gives way to other realities. The loneliness of the long distance runner is a thing of the past. Marathoning has become big time sport and big time business. New York and Chicago are doing the bidding. The emissary in the sport is Bob Bright. The Fred Lebo of Chicago. Wright says he spread $150,000 in appearance Chicago fees. Chicago has overcome its number two marathon status by outspending New York and getting better competition. So the battle lines are now clearly drawn in this tale of two cities. Certainly Bob Wright was our staunchest uh, enemy. New York has a certain stature, at least they feel that stature, and they like to look out here towards the Midwest and say we're the second city. But I think in this marathoning business, we're not the second city. Me and Bob Wright really went head to head because Bob's event, the Chicago Marathon, was around the same time as New York. And that was competition. You know, who can have the better prize money? Who can have the better athletes? Who has the better event? The winner of New York City Marathon is an instant celebrity. They can cash in immensely. Once prize money came in, it attracts the media. It attracts the public. It makes it more exciting. It raises the level of competition. If they want to surpass Chicago in terms of the competition, uh, Fred will have to fight even harder. But Bob Bright's a competitor too, you know? <laughs> They're like the runners, you know? Having Bill Rogers in your event is a big deal. I mean, four times Boston, four times New York. Um, uh, and I wanted them in Chicago, so, but I could see that what Fred was gonna do is just sort of wait it out. Well, I would call Fred up. You know, I, I would be counting on going. I want to run, you know? But at the same time, my fee was going up a little bit. And he did offer me a deal, but it was, I, felt, I felt sort of demeaning because I would have had to wear, there was a brokerage company which was gonna pay me my fee. And I had to wear it on my chest and I think on, on my butt. <laughs> I said, this is ridiculous. I said, no, I'm not gonna do that. So I'll let it go. It has been a very, very interesting day. Bill Rogers did not win the marathon today for the fifth consecutive year. A man who won it from the University of Oregon, Alberto Salazar, finished in a record time today. He's riding his arm. He's got 30 seconds left for a world record performance. at the U.S. Olympic Trials. I remember this guy coming up to me and talking to me about a marathon, New York City Marathon, which I'd heard a little bit about but didn't know much about. And he handed me like a brochure and I think a card and told me that he'd be interested in having me back to run that that next fall. He probably knew, yeah, that in the long term that I was going to continue to get better and Bill perhaps was starting to peak out. You know, he, he made some bets there that, that I was going to do it, and uh, to some extent, you know, he bet his, his credibility. He taught me a lot about, you know, having guts and courage and not being scared to go out on a limb. And if you really wanted to capture you know, the hearts and minds of New Yorkers, you had to give them a great story, a great personality. It certainly made me in New York uh, when I went and won the race. And, New Yorkers loved that, that sort of confident, can-do attitude. Ended up kind of uh, epitomizing my sort of career or character over the next few years. So he was right there with me, sort of plotting and pumping me up. We have some very, 
very distinguished and honored guest here today. We welcome Alberto Salazar, Greta Weitz. I'd like to present these to President Reagan, and I hope that these will help him in his race for re-election. Alberto, thank you very much. I promise not to use them in a marathon. <laughs> thank you very much. Alberto is the new hot guy, and I'm the has-been. You know, I had had my chances, my time, you know, and suddenly it's over. I did see Fred uh, uh, change and, and, and grow and, and uh, as the world around him grew. Fred was an amazing, brilliant manipulator and would do anything for a result, any means to an end. Unbeknownst to the public at large, Fred, Bob, and myself were best of friends. Fred was the first to recognize that he and I fighting in public was, was good for marathoning. He said, this, this is working, okay? The more uh, that I sort of poked at Fred, the more visibility it would put on my race. And Fred, of course, played it back the same way. Fred had, a, had an instinct for the media. What would make a news story, and um, and it was it was a bit of a game. I don't know if I asked you on this tape about the being a the club and being a being a benevolent tyrant. Yeah, well, my answer to it is mainly because I had to accomplish something very fast. I knew what I wanted to carry out, and I had to do it myself in disregarding perhaps niceties and diplomacy. What was an example of how you once were a tyrant? I never called a director's meeting in five years. All decisions were made by me and they were final. And Fred wasn't so much a dictator as he was a, a chaos creator that made things happen just because nobody was grounded around him. He liked smart guys. And, and that meant people who often were corrupt. I'd find people who were double billing us. And I'd say, Fred, these people are double billing us. What are we doing? He said, oh, that, he said that shows how smart they are. I know they'll do a good job for us because they're so smart. I don't even think he wanted the books to be in good order. He gave my treasures report. And I said, well, we lost money last year. I hope that we, we do things smarter. Then Fred got up and he said, this coming year, I hope we lose even more money. And that will tell me we're doing good. Afterwards, I said, Fred, you're trying to lose money? He said, yes. I want to put, a, put us in a position where the sponsors have to come through for even more. He was outrageous. Fred called me one day. I was, had a big meeting here at my office. And my secretary came in twice and said, Fred LeBeau's on the phone. He says, Jack, I just, I don't want to, he was always very polite with me. I don't want to upset you. But one question, is it true you called me an unguided missile? And I thought about it for a second. I said, yes, Fred. Oh, good, thank you, that's all I wanted to know. There were always issues uh, because the, the number of races and their size grew, and as that happened, uh, it generated all kinds of issues. Yeah, we had a lot of difficulties with Fred. They were getting the use of Central Park free. That's all right, as long as nobody made money for the service. And the police force and everything else were working free. So if they found out that runners were getting paid, then other people had to get paid too. When people would ask him about prize money in the office or whatever, he said, it's sort of like the hole in the donut. And they looked at him and he said, well, you don't see a hole in the donut. 
but it's there. And so there was, I suppose, an implicit agreement that uh, they could do, you know, that we would look the other way. So then he goes and writes a book uh, boasting about how clever he was to uh, fool us. It was a uh, biography, I guess, and Fred admitted that we had fooled the mayor by paying athletes under the table. That pissed me off. Having read the revelations in Lebo's book, New York Mayor Edward Koch says the marathon can no longer be treated with the attitude of public benevolence which helped it to flourish. For every dollar he now gives to runners, Lebo must also give a dollar to the city of New York. We were all worried about how we were going to pay the city now for a race that we didn't have to pay them before. He would make statements and do things to push everyone, including the mayor. There were times when I would get a call from Fred, um, sometimes at home, sometimes uh, at kind of strange hours. What did you think of the race? Did you think it went off all right? He'd want feedback. But I think it was always a can you top this principle, doing a, a race every year, a marathon. Oh, it wasn't as good as last year. What are you going to do now, Fred? Are you losing steam? Fred did have moments when he'd push the rock up the hill, the rock had stayed up there, and now it was teetering down again, and he had to get back and, and get it going for the next year. And the part of that was depression, or he didn't know what to do with his time. I think this is a man who didn't uh, handle free time very well. I think he needed missions, he needed projects, and if he didn't have a marathon coming up for 364 days, I suspect he would invent something else to keep himself busy, you know, chastising his staff, or next year we've got to get this, or hitting up on a sponsor. Was it chaotic? Yes. Did we thrive on it? Yes. Did we all stay? Yes. Yes, we did. And I think that speaks volumes. You can talk to people who say it was chaotic. You can talk to people who say his management style was off the wall. But then you need to ask the question, well, did you stay or did you leave? Nobody left. Nobody ever left. Well, what are the rewards for you? Well, um, there are many. Um, Last year, when Alberto Salazar broke the world's record, I was elated. I was, it was a dream come true. It was almost too much, because I felt there sh always should be something left over. Uh, it's all about the end of a dream. But dreams beget dreams, and you go on. And it's amazing how much more there is to do. Fred was a fixture at the finish, and he wasn't just a fixture for the first person. He stayed out there till it was dark. What he did professionally and personally was inherently a part of his character, and that character was honed and hardened and created by the wits and the will and whatever suffering which he never spoke of. It took him to survive, and so he got it. You had all the amenities and the pasta parties and all the treats and the blanket at the end and the medal and the rose for the women. And each year he would embellish this. He understood that it really wasn't so much about running a road race. The reason it's so popular is because people are desperate for a personal challenge. When it was all said and done, and we had this event, and it was over, I learned something that has carried me through to this day. And I found Fred sitting on a bench by himself at the finish line. And I sat down, and he said, what's the matter? I said, oh, I just don't know. I'm so depressed. And he said, oh, I'm this way every year. Do you understand? You're depressed because it's over. And 
Um, it was this exquisite understanding that you could care about something so deeply and be so involved, and that's what you call living in the moment, that when it was gone, you missed it. January of 1990, he met a presentation to uh, a press person. And then there was another presentation right after that, and Fred said exactly the same thing. Not cognizant at all of what had occurred. And everybody around my table, a lot of his closest friends and volunteers, realized, oh, we have a problem. He called up uh, his doctor, Dr. Sander. They took an MRI saw that there was a spot in his brain. A, a lymphoma was detected on the, based on the biopsy. Uh, and that was, you know, incurable. I mean, lymphoma of the brain, you know, is, is, you know, is a death knell, unfortunately. And it was just a matter of time. He came over to me and said, I do have brain cancer. It's positive. I'm going to beat it, but that's what it is. And we cried together, and I came back to the office, and the staff was all waiting to hear what the report was. And just like I am now, I was crying, and I said, it's brain cancer. But Fred will beat it. And everybody started crying as well. And then we knew we had to get on with the business, because that's what Fred wanted us to do. It was very positive. He never thought he's going to. He was sure he would make it. And uh, the till he had the less energy, he wanted always to go to the office, even just sitting down, just to be there. I think I become much mellower. I no longer refer to as a czar. I'm more involved with my family now than ever before. That has become very important to me. He was in my office one morning and, um, and he said, you can call me Fischl Leibovitz from now on. Why, Fred? And he said, because I don't want to die under an assumed name. One day, I saw Fred jogging, but his jogging was slower than his walking. So I said, Fred, how come you're jogging when it's slower than walking? And he said, because the jogging is different. The jogging has a rhythm that the walking doesn't have. He was up and at it. I have to tell you, even when he was <laughs> at Mount Sinai, he had marked off in the hallways uh, a little course for himself. He was out in the hallway with his, you know, with his IV and his, his hospital thing on, his hospital gown, and he was going top speed down the hall. He was, and he hadn't measured the miles. Oh, I just got a mile in. I just got two miles in. So he wasn't going to let this thing, you know, get, get to him. After he was operated on, he was still recovering. He was in still looking pretty poor at the time and and we had the marathon and he went out some of the uh, people at the organization didn't want Fred to do that because he looked bad would be a bad example of the organization and, and people shouldn't see somebody looking so sickly among a healthy sport and the rest of us thought, said no no Fred's an inspiration
Amazing news tonight about Fred LeBeau. Well, you could say Fred LeBeau is the New York City Marathon. Fred LeBeau is a remarkable man. Fred LeBeau, of course, the founding father of the New York City Marathon, but just over two years ago, LeBeau was sidelined by brain cancer. Then doctors gave him only a few months to live. He's directed the marathon since its inception back in 1970, and now he's announced that he will run the race for the first time this year, three years after he was diagnosed with brain cancer. Comes along 1992, and Fred is going to run the New York City Marathon after being race director for so many years and being involved in it for so many years. He had always wanted to run it. But he couldn't, he was so busy. If visionary race director Fred LeBeau manages to cross his own finish line today, he'll have finally captured his own American dream. I refer to it as my child. I don't have a wife, I don't have any kids, but it is like nurturing a child. For 23 years, that's all I did. In 1992, I got the opportunity to run with Fred uh, uh, when he decided to do his own race for the first time. On that day, unfortunately, there was a false start. We were up at uh, the podium, and you know, when the cannon went off, and he realized that the men started like 20 seconds, 30 seconds before they should. Fred got very upset, and he said, I can't run, you know, I have to make sure that this is okay. And I was like, Fred, we are going to run this race. Hi, Jim. We've just gone through four miles, and Fred has averaged 12 minutes and 10 seconds a mile. That's pretty quick. And let me tell you, it's a real zoo out here. There's a lot of noise. It's not for me, it's for Fred. And we actually lost him. There are so many people coming over the bridge. We had trouble finding him. One person took it from the streets of the Bronx, you know, next to next to uh, McCombs Ham Park, where 20 of us were freezing down to, down to the streets of New York and the streets of the world. Coming up on the halfway point, and I really have to take my hat off to Fred. He's been clicking off 12 minute miles. I've seen a lot of cancer patients in my day, but I haven't seen many that can do this. I am truly impressed. The other thing about Fred is he remains Fred. He's been using a cellular phone every now and then to keep posted on the winners and whether he owes them any extra prize money. Typically Fred. I think Fred said this best. He said, you know, we can't all be actors. We can't all be singers. We can't perform on the stage, but for that one day, for that time you're out there, it's your stage, it's your moment. You have your rites of passage. You will go through the good times. You will go through the challenging times. You will go through the five neighborhoods, and they're almost like, you know, the great literary stories that talk about a journey. We're used to passively seeing someone else's journey, but what Fred understood for himself and for all those thousands of people was this was their journey, that you could have your moment on the stage. And that's why he so carefully took care of everyone that was calling to him. Um, and he made it a calling for the rest of us. There is Fred Lebo still running it out. And there's Greta Bites with him, just out of your picture on the right side of you. There she is, both wearing their ages. <laughs> and this is a run for the ages. That's what Fred was looking for, was establishing something that was both pure, but also had a kind of mythology about it that people who look back on it would always say, New York was very special. He made it. I don't know if it would have done as well or been what it was without him at the helm. The time, the place, the magic, the myth were all put into play because the right person was there at the right time. And that's how history is made.
see him complete the race that he started and he saw grow and he fathered and then he was able to complete it. And so Fred got a chance to run his race. It was unbelievable. Words don't do it justice. So in that sense, I think he was transformed. He got to feel what everybody who ran his race felt. He stormed with his feet and he clapped with his hands. He summoned all of his joy when he laughed. It suffered all of his joy when he cried. And sometimes when he got into talking, man, he could rattle on and on. He was a good man and now he's gone. Tiger, when it was over like a dove, he summoned all of his strength and decline. It suffered all of his strength in the fall. Sometimes when he got into fighting, man, he could fight with you. 